So before we go into the webinar in more detail today, I just wanted to give a quick overview to the sorts of things that you can use the uh, procedural mesh network for when dealing with uh, motion graphics and also other parts of Maya as well where it comes into its own. So an example of this would be using MASH as a modeling tool, for example. So this goes far beyond just traditional motion graphics. This chain mail scene here that we're seeing was done uh, with MASH and this forest environment as well, which is a very dense environment uh, with a lot of detail in there, was all done using MASH networks uh, to deal with very large numbers of instances. What's new to Maya 2017 in terms of the mesh network and the way we deal with these different behaviors is the ability to actually be able to use the new mesh editor, which is a new feature in Maya 2017. And this allows you to be able to change the order in which your behaviors are being evaluated with a simple layering system. You can turn these on and off. You can mute. You can change the order in which these behaviors are being evaluated so it really does give you a lot of flexibility which previously uh, in my 2016 extension 2 you would have had to have done using the node editor so an example here of of some mesh behavior would be a signal node for example and this is just a way to add some basic noise to your instances so uh, this is 4d noise in this case and we're just changing it to apply it to either the position or the scale or both so you have a lot of control over how these instances are being dealt with you can change the type of noise being used so we're switching it to brownian motion so you have huge amounts of control over how your network behaves so another example of my behaviors is the strength node so this essentially gives the, you the ability to be able to completely mute your mesh network and your behavior so you're scaling down all behaviors in your mesh network to essentially zero to where the instances began before you started adding behaviors other parts of mesh that are very impressive are the ability to be able to take your mesh behaviors and use it to drive any other part of Maya that you can think of. So uh, this is done via the MASH breakout node. And this is the ability to take those behaviors and connect it to things like extrude in this case, or perhaps you could drive the joint rotation of a character via your MASH behaviors. So here we're taking audio and we're using it to drive a MASH network, which in turn drives the extrude operator on your model. So here's just a further example of uh, using audio to drive behaviors in MASH. So the other side to MASH that we'll be covering in more detail further on in this presentation is the use of falloff objects. So any behaviors that you have in MASH you can actually have a nice falloff and this can be driven by any number of uh, influences, whether it's an implicit sphere, as we saw there, or uh, NURBS curves or meshes. And we'll cover this in more detail shortly. So we can use objects with colored textures to drive either shaders in mesh or color nodes in mesh. So here we're actually able to drive an Arnold shader with the color of the mesh that is driving the instances. The 3D type tool is also had a big overhaul in my 2017 and this gives us much much cleaner 3D text so this will deal with a lot of the intersection problems that you would have had in previous versions so now we have a lot of control over how the 3D type is created so one of the key strengths of MASH is its ease of use. So it has a fantastic UI that's very self-explanatory. All of the icons are linked to the behaviors that they actually carry out and execute. So for instance, the audio node, yes, that's very obvious. It has a nice kind of graphic equalizer icon to go with that. So it's very easy for people to pick up and learn. So what we're seeing here all lives in the waiter which essentially is your menu for picking and choosing your behaviors that you'd like to use in MASH. There's also utility nodes as well for things like exploding a mesh and adding trails and that sort of thing. 
So additional utilities that are worth mentioning for Mesh are the inclusion of things like a blend deformer or a jiggle deformer. So there's lots of additional things that you can do in Mesh that sit well outside of the traditional motion graphics workflow. So one new feature of motion graphics in Maya that we haven't mentioned is the introduction of something we call the SVG node. Now this is a very simple means for you to be able to import vector graphics into your Maya scene. So the way this works is you simply open up your Adobe Illustrator session or your vector graphics session and you can copy and paste directly from Adobe Illustrator into Maya now via the SVG node. So here we're seeing some vector graphics um, saying M in and then the Maya logo and we're able to bring this directly into Maya as a 3D object. So this is perfect for being able to bring in things like logos from your clients and any vector graphics that you've generated in Adobe Illustrator. So really it's just about ease of workflow and simple functionality. So here just by adding a couple of Boolean operators we're able to get the items from Adobe Illustrator into Maya and then be able to build the scene that we saw there in those initial videos very quickly and easily. So let's take an in-depth look at some of the functionality of MASH and how we can generate some pretty interesting effects um, very simply in, in, in a very efficient manner. So we've got this scene here, we've got a couple of items in there already, we've got the little cube there we saw at the beginning and we're going to set up a MASH network. And in doing this we have the heart of the MASH network which is your distribute node and this just determines how many instances you have. It defaults to linear so it's just got 10 instances that have been created of this and we ran it in mesh mode which means you can actually generate a single mesh even though we've got 10 instances here. So you've got lots of controls. So all these sliders that you see me pulling around here, they're all animatable functions. So we've switched the uh, distribute node to a radial mode, so we can adjust the quantity of instances here. If we can ramp this up to say 5,000, so we can have a very large number, we still have great performance. And we can then go in and start tweaking the values, so the angle for instance. We can change the uh, Z offset value here, we can change the radius. And as I said, all of these values are animatable, so you can use these to generate some pretty interesting effects. So there's also a grid mode. So you can very easily populate a grid in all directions. It doesn't just have to be two-dimensional. And then in the scene here, we're actually going to be using a separate mesh as an influence for how we place these instances in the scene. So by doing this, we simply drag and drop our sphere that we've got here in the scene to our input mesh within the distribute node. So if we ramp up the uh, quantity to 5000 you'll see that they've scattered themselves all over. So we're in scatter mode currently. We can switch it by vertex. So if we then adjust the um, number of instances uh, it's done by point order so we get a nice ordered distribution of the vertices. We can do this as a random order as well. So we can do it by random vertex. So now you'll see that they're appearing in a random order all over that sphere. And we can also flood the mesh as well. So this will this will basically put uh, an instance per vertice on the mesh. We can also do it by uh, voxel space. So this essentially is filling the volume of the object. So if we hide the sphere we can see that it's actually filled that whole volume inside the sphere with the instances. So if we go back to our mesh network now, we're going to switch this back to random vertice and we're going to start playing around with some other settings in mesh. So we added a visibility node here. And we're actually going to use a texture uh, to drive where these instances are appearing on the sphere. So we've got this map of the world here as a specular map. And you'll see here that it's um, changed how which of those instances are actually visible but it's not quite looking right at the moment and this is simply because we need to adjust the uh, map projection so at the moment it's just in the y-axis if we middle click and drag this sphere over as a map helper uh, this will actually match the UVs of the sphere so now we see that the the world actually looks correct as we orbit around it 
so finally uh, I just want to add a bit of spinning to this so I can add a transform node in mesh and I've got a locator in the scene which already has some animation on it so I can drag and drop this locator over to the controller null input of that transform node so if we do this and then hit play you'll see that it inherits the animation of that locator so now that we've done that we can start to have some fun with this so we can go in and add things like some noise to this which generates a very simple particle style effect and again this is all running in real time in the viewport so there's lots of different options available to us with the signal node we can loop the noise we can add brownian motion so we've deleted that node and we're going to now go in and add some audio as a driver so we're just going to bring in a wave file and then we're going to apply this as a driver for the scale of our instances so we're going to really ramp up the value so we can actually see the effect happening and then under the frequency graph settings we have the number of bands or channels that are being driven by the audio so the more bands that we have uh, in terms of quantity this will drive more effects so as we hit play now we'll see that the scale of the instance is essentially giving us a very interesting looking graphic equalizer effect on the spinning globe so if we want to make this scene look a little bit more interesting something to point out in the content browser you can actually load some mash presets from our, our examples tab in the content browser so this helps you learn how mash works and you can load in some predetermined examples and so you can use it as a starting point or to help beef up some of your animation in your scene so here we're just adding some extra mash networks that we already have to just add a bit more substance to this example here we're just going to loop the timing of this so it populates our entire scene and if we play this through now you see we've got something quite interesting looking so because the mesh networks all live it's very easy for us to switch out these objects so you can do this in both instance mode and you can also do it in mesh mode so if we see here we've added another sphere there and we can switch it out instead of the cube so if we hit play now you see that that scale effect is, is working on the uh, spheres instead of the flat cubes that we had before and if we change it from spectrum to average on our audio node we get this very interesting kind of spiky hedgehog effect on our planet so I've got a nice video here which was put together for us by the mainframe team uh, for the release of Maya 2016 extension 2 now the spinning cube at the beginning of this video I wanted to focus on is a little bit of a case study as to how quickly and easily we can generate this kind of complex effects using the mesh network so here's the spinning cube I wanted to replicate in Maya today and this is an example that was put together by uh, Ian Waters for uh, our NAB presentation and I just thought it was a great case study for how quickly and easily you can generate these kind of effects in MASH so here we're just duplicating our little pyramid that we've got in the scene and using the distribute node in MASH we're actually using the grid settings so we've just got a 14 by 14 panel of these pyramids and now we're going to start adding some behaviors to this so we're going to add an offset node to this and I'd actually like to offset the rotation so as you see there it's flipped all of those pyramids by 180 degrees and now we're applying a fall off object to this so as we drag this fall off object through the panel we can see that it's driving that rotation effect so we're going to set some keys on this so that as we scrub through the timeline we can see that effect happening so the next stage for this I'd like to add another offset object to the translation so we're going to scoot all of those pyramids up a little bit in Y and with this second fall off object we're going to be able to also drive the effect of those and the reason I'm not using that same first fall off object will become apparent shortly so basically with the second fall off object I'd actually like to change the profile of the wave as, as it goes through so we can do this using the fall off ramp so as you see here as I move those spline curves it's actually changing the profile so that now we're getting more of a ripple effect going through there so finally I want to make this disappear so the way I can do this is to use the strength node which essentially just mutes the entire network and the effect of this will be essentially making it 
disappear into thin air. So we'll create another fall off object for this. And as we move this fall off object through there, it'll actually make it vanish. So finally, now that we've got one side of the cube done, we basically want to populate all the sides of the cube. So we can do this by using another object in our scene. So I've got just a simple cube. And the beauty of Mesh is you can actually create a Mesh network of a Mesh network. So as long as you're in Mesh mode, you can actually do this very quickly and easily. So you see here, we've duplicated those size of the cube and there's a couple of different modes here that we can do so if we go back to our distribute node we're in linear at the moment if we switch this to mesh we can then simply middle click and drag that cube in our scene into the input mesh and you'll see that the size of the um, cube will start to attach themselves but it still doesn't quite look how we want it to. So the reason for this is there's a couple of different modes. We can do it by vertex, but what we want is the face center so that now it will adhere perfectly to the size of those cube. And finally, we want to add a little bit of spin to this. So the way we can do this is to go back to our mash network and we can add a transform node. So I've got a locator in the scene which already has a little bit of animation on there. So we can simply uh, middle click, drag and drop that uh, null locator over as a controller null. So it'll inherit the animation of that locator. So that as we scrub through the timeline now, we'll see a little bit of a spin on there as well. We have something that looks fairly similar to what we saw in that original video. So I'm just going to roll that video again just so we can see the finished article. Obviously animated much nicer than I can do because uh, animation is not my day job. But really it was just to illustrate how quickly and easily you can generate these effects using Mesh. So we've already looked a little bit at fall-offs and, and how useful they are in, in, in the MASH universe. I wanted to delve in a little bit further and show how they could be used for things like animating a robot's face, for example. So I've got a couple of bits here in the scene. I've got my robot face. I've got a couple of NURBS curves, which I've got some animation on. So uh, they're just some shape keys to just be able to add some emotion to our robot. So these are going to be the drivers for the fall off objects and we'll see how these all come together now. I've also got a little cube in my scene called Pixel. So what I'd like to do is basically create a uh, screen effect on the robot. So I'm going to use the MASH network to um, distribute these using the grid settings. So we're just going to populate that face with all these pixels. So from here, what I'd like to do is actually use these NURBS curves as a driver for the facial animation of our robot. So to do this, I'm going to use the color node and I'm going to apply those curves as a fall off object. So to do this, you would first create a couple of basic fall off objects. I'm going to add a background color of black and a foreground color of blue. So it'll be the fall off objects that are driving where that blue color sits on our pixels. So we create a couple of empty fall off objects and then this is where we can drag and drop our NURBS curves as a connected object. So it uses the shape of those NURBS curves to drive where the fall off object sits. So by default we would get a spherical implicit object which can be animated and transformed but we're going to drag and drop these NURBS curves over to our in shape of the fall off object. So you can see it's already having a bit of influence there. We're actually going to reduce the uh, sh custom shape radius. So this is, is essentially the fall off from the curve, which is why it was so, so much bigger than our curve to begin with. And we're going to apply two fall off objects, so one for each, each curve to drive the effect of that color. So you'll see here if I select the NURBS curves and move them a bit closer to the robot's face, you'll see that they will have an influence on which pixels are essentially lit up 
or cubes in this case. So now if we go back to our shape editor, we can start to see that as we animate the uh, shape keys of those NURBS curves, they're having an effect now on the fall off. So we get a sort of quite a cute little robot animation. So what's nice again, because MASH is procedural and it's all live linked, you can actually go in and simply scale down the uh, size of that cube or pixel and we can create essentially a high resolution look for our robot face. So we scale these down, we're just going to obviously bump up the quantity so that it looks more like a little screen and then if we go back to our shape editor now we can see the animated effect of those eyes so we can hide those curves and then you can see the effect that they're having. And what's nice is we're still able to transform them. So in theory, you could rig these curves up if you wanted to have a really direct kind of sculpting feel to creating those character poses on the eyes. And we can also go and have a bit of fun. So if we wanted to also exaggerate the effect, we can add an offset on the scale, for example. So if we look at this from the side now, you'll see that as well as lighting up those colors, we can reuse those fall off objects to drive our scale effect. So those pixels will essentially look like they're kind of jumping out from the screen a little bit. So you can see as we animate the eye expressions, it's not only changing the color, it's also changing the scale. So once you've set up these fall off objects, you can reuse them in as many different mash nodes as you wish. So there's a few other effects that we can do if we want to go back to the color node, for example, in our MASH network. We can use that random hue again. So it keeps the overall blue shade that we're looking at. We can change the background color if we want to. And we can also change the random hue of this. So if you want to make it look a little bit more static effect on those eyes you can do this very easily as well to create quite a nice little robot feel now one of the strengths of mash is because we are generating a proxy mesh here so this isn't just instances this generates a single mesh we can actually deform this so whether this is with a rig or in this case I'm going to use a bend deformer just to show the effect very quickly and easily so we're applying this to our box and we're also applying it to our grid mesh network. So you can see you can add some fun and, and it's keeping all those pixels live. You can still animate the effect even though we've started bending it. So we can have those eyes moving around. So it just shows how quickly you can generate some quite complex effects using the power of fall off objects in mesh. So not only is it a motion graphics tool, it's fantastic for character work like this. So one example I wanted to look at here was how to use MASH as a basic flocking system. So here we've got three fish both sharing the same animation cycle at the moment. And we're going to use the flight node in MASH to be able to generate a, a flocking behavior with, with the school of fish. So what we'd like to do here is actually take these fish which at the moment are just kind of floating around in space and have them follow an object. So we've actually got a locator in the scene which has um, got a motion path to drive itself around this curve. And we're going to actually use this to influence the flight node. So we can simply drag and drop the locator as an attractor object in the flight node. And you'll see that now those fish are actually following where that locator is going in space. So something we can do then within the flight node is to start adjusting all sorts of different settings in terms of how separated the fish are from each other, the speed, we can vary the velocity of each one. But what we'd like to do now is actually take these three fish and actually give them uh, an ID using the ID node in MASH. So this will allow us to actually have three different varieties of fish as opposed to just taking the first of our selection when we set up the mesh network. So in doing this we can also add a um, random seed value here which allows us to change you know exactly how many of each 
type of fish we have showing. And once we have this, we can actually use the time node in MASH to be able to vary the timings of each cycle and the velocity of each cycle. So if we go and actually adjust the number of start and end values we have for each cycle, we can see that suddenly these fish will all have different cycles running at different start and end points and we can give them different time scales as well. So if we adjust the random time scale value, then some will be moving faster, some will be moving slower, even though they all started off with the same animation cycle. So it's an incredibly powerful way for you to be able to get variety into your animation, whether it's for a school of fish in this case, or it could be a fleet of spaceships. Here's our finished school of fish, just following the locator around the scene with lots of variety in there in terms of the animation. Another usage for the time node is for something like this where we started off with just a single eyeball opening and closing but as you can see we've, we've been able to add all sorts of offset values here in terms of timing and speed and so you can generate a large scene of objects all with different timings uh, very quickly and easily using the time node in MASH. So um, I wanted to cover some of the uh, resources available before we switch over to uh, the mainframe guys. This is playing. So there's a few places you can go to get some examples. We've got the Creative Market. Um, this is essentially a place where you can download a lot of the scenes that we've seen in these marketing videos and you can see how they've been built and when what nodes have been used in the MASH network to actually apply that. So these are all available as free downloads. And uh, as well as that, we've also got an excellent Vimeo channel um, provided by the mainframe team, where they've got a huge number of uh, videos that Ian has put together um, over the development of MASH over the last couple of years. So a lot of the stuff I've shown today, like the, the School of Fish example there, he's got a much more detailed tutorial on that as well. And we've also been putting together uh, a new website, actually, uh, as part of our motion graphics drive. Uh, it's motiongraphics.autodesk.com. And this will also link you back to some of the Vimeo channels and, and tutorials. But it, it's a great starting point for getting to learn some of this stuff. So we really are you know, upping the number of resources available. We'll be putting um, this webinar up on our uh, Meet the Experts landing page after today, and, and then eventually we'll be looking at other other um, channels for you to be able to download this content as well. But that will be the starting point for that. I believe we've reached that time where I'll be switching over to the mainframe guys now. Are you guys here, Chris and Ian? We are, yep. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Did you want to do some webcam as well so we can see a, a, a face or, or is, do you have it enabled? Um, aha, there, we we there we are. <laughs> I'll move over. Oh, no. So, uh, there we are. Where are we? Here, here they are. So, uh, yep, this is Chris and Ian all the way from Manchester today. Yeah. And uh, I was actually going to plant a question to get things going. I was hoping um, you could tell us a bit about the advantages of the uh, repro mesh, so the mesh mode for mesh versus uh, the pure instance mode and, and some of the benefits of that. And I believe if I stop sharing this picture, if you do wish to okay. share anything uh, to show us, you're, you're able to drive. <laughs> All right. Um yeah, I mean the, the so Mash was originally built on the back of the uh, the instancer, and um, part of us joining forces, uh, you know, when we joined forces with uh, you guys at Autodesk, um, one of the first things we wanted to do is try and enable things like um, the bring in the color node and bring in the time node, which sort of allowing you to then, you know, as you showed in that school of fish, to offset you know Olympic animations that you're bringing in or caches that you're bringing in or or just animation itself. Obviously, it opens up a huge amount of uh, sort of flexibility and possibilities in there as well. And uh, as you touched on, it's then around deforming everything, 
reproing repros, so sort of nesting repros within our repros, and what else have you got to add on that? Well, you? yeah, effectively, um, you would want to use the repro when you can. So the, 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 the disadvantage of the repro is that when you have millions and millions of polygons, you can slow the scene down. So obviously, if you've got huge amounts of mesh, then an instancer is faster. So we, we know of scenes where people have two and four billion polygons going through mesh. But using the instancer on the other side, you couldn't do that with the repro nodes. So it's kind of it does depend on the kind of scene that you're trying to do. Uh, but for a lot of motion graphics work, the repro node is definitely the place to start off with. It's why it's our default. Um, and then if you if you suffer with performance, then then switch over to the instancer. I mean, it's it's really it's for very densely populated um, scenes. But the the yeah the the advantages of the repro are yeah as as you mentioned. Yeah, I think we would you know the, the way that we operate with Mash. Uh, at mainframe is that if if you're not going to use time or color and you don't need them, use the instancer because it's just it's lighter and, and quicker. Yeah, uh, and sorry, and deformation as well. Yeah. So, so, so you can also mix them though. So um, if, in one of the examples there, you, if you start off with a repro mesh, if you want to put that inside another mesh network, that other mesh network that you put it inside can be in, an instancer. So you could so yes, you can mix the two of them like that and then get the best well, to a certain extent get the best of both worlds. So. Yeah. Okay, and am I right in thinking you're able to uh, change halfway if you decide, oh, actually, I wanted to have that in instancer mode, or or not? Is that is that a function? It certainly is. Yeah, it's, um, I think I think we're going to show you how. <laughs> we might see ourselves here. Let me just try and do that. Can you see Maya there? Yes. Yeah, we can see that. So and one. and just while the guys are loading this up, if, if there are any questions uh, on the floor, please feel free to uh, type them into the uh, chat window and uh, we can try and fit in as many as we can in the allotted time. Yeah, sure. So I've just created a, uh, you know, very quickly just selected a node and created a mesh network there. Um, so you've got the options here as your default. Looks like I'm set on instancer at the moment. So we have this is interesting, Morgan. You're not using the mash editor. You need to use the mash editor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, this, 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 again, this is something that was brought in in 2017. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, one of the things that was happening is as your um, networks get more and more complex, and you're adding several mash networks, your outliner was getting, you know, potentially getting quite clogged up, and in related things not necessarily next to each other in that list. So the mash editor here is a, a really cool tool for managing your networks basically so you know for example if i create another one here so now we've got we've got mash 2 there which is those uh, uh spheres and so you can just sort of you can quickly turn on and off effects and you can just really start to you know either troubleshoot or start to art direct your your work however you like to do it but the other thing worth noting is you can as you say you can get to the instancer from here um, or you could then switch geometry type via this little menu on this side. This also lives up here. Uh, where is it? You need to select a way to. Need to select a way to sorry to do it in over here, but it's over here as well. But you can just do switch geometry type, and now we've switched over to a repro, as you can see here. And a nice handy icon tells you which one you've got when you've got the editor open. So that if it's two cubes, then it's uh, the repro, and then if it's two checkerboards, then it's the instancer. So. Yeah. Uh, nice. So uh, inside tips and tricks now. <laughs> yeah, I mean we we now can't live without the mash editor. I think it's um it's been one of those sort of under undercover features really, but it, you know that organisation, as I say, once you get into really quite complex networks, then um, organising your scene becomes really important. Yeah. Daryl's recent videos have been very good for that. He organ he's organising everything with it. So. Great. Yeah, no, it, it's definitely going to improve the workflow. Certainly, like you said, not having to trawl through trying to find your mash networks just because they're all available. Yeah, uh, in, it's, a, it's a quick fire way to launch the different networks. There's some good other little things in here while we're there, so we can, you know, we can rename this to this, and it's automatically naming all your associated nodes as well. Ah, nice. You can also duplicate mash networks through the right-click menu as well. There, yeah. so that works. Yeah. Yep. So, so um, I uh, presume you guys can see the little chat window at the bottom. We've got a couple of questions uh, coming up now. I think the first one was, can you show any examples of how to use the Python node, or is that a bit of a beast to fit into? <laughs> oh, oh, my word. Definitely is, John. 
Um, yes, I can show you an example of. I can I can load it. Uh, yeah, there he is. <laughs> live scripting. <laughs> so uh, here's the Python node, and I'm. What's this? Is that the spheres one? Yeah, that can go right. Okay, so the Python node can call any Maya um, uh, can call any Maya scripts at all. You can just import at the top here. You could do import uh, Maya.cmds as uh, cmds, and then you can just call any Maya um, command uh, as you would normally. So you can get information about your scene and then use it to uh, set attributes in Maya or whatever that kind of thing. I'm trying to think of an example of something to do. Uh -huh, it's one of those. Um, <laughs> so. If I had a few seconds, I could go and get some scripts. <laughs> but um, what should we do? So we can. Oh, hold on a second. So I think if we do. Um, uh, uh, um, I think. I think that's a command. I can't remember. This is where this is up. No, that's not a command. Can anyone, can anyone remember what that command is? <laughs> oh, Google. Uh, uh, oh, hold on a second. Maybe. maybe. Uh, oh no, it's here. I've done it already. So what we can do is instead of doing out position here, if we do out rotation, and then we do the x-axis, and then we do it something like um, if we say yeah, if we just say frame here, and then hit, frame, and then we hit the playback, all of our objects will rotate as the frame increases. <laughs> High, high pressure uh, situation there, Ian. I think you've done very well. <laughs> it's, uh, it's too, it's too good a question. <laughs> uh, I think uh, it does, it does relate to the idea that the, the the Python node was built because we were getting so many requests for very, very specific things that people wanted to do. Yeah. And um, it was kind of invented as a way to try and prevent too much feature bloat, really, within Mash. Mm. You know, very specific controls that are only good for very specific things. Um, what Python though does, if we could think of some really awesome examples, yeah. and we and we had some we could copy and paste in there now, we could talk through them. Um, yeah. But yeah, what it does, it just opens it up to you know if if you are my, you know Python minded, then you can probably work your way through and get Mash doing what you want it to do. Yeah. And so we we, got, we do you've uh, got stuff on your Vimeo channel, haven't you, Ian, for Python tutorials? Correct. So we've got um, we've got a video up there, and I think I go through some very different kinds of Fibonacci distributions. So I make a Fibonacci spiral and a sphere, and then there's this crazy, amazing um, effector that I made as well. And the scripts are all available to download there. So I, I, I well, I, the, the link to the scripts is definitely on my YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, is it on here as well? I don't know. It might be, but it's this vid here. Yeah. Um, I'll post that in the chat. If anybody wants to watch that one? Yeah, so the same videos on YouTube as well, and if it's not, if the Python scripts aren't on here, then they're definitely there, and it just you can just that, copy and paste them in. So sounds good. And then I think uh, one of the other questions I saw a second ago was, uh, oops, I've gone up a bit too high there, was about um, let's just enlarge this window slightly. I can see. Don't scroll up. So uh, the other question was, can you tell us a little bit about how the pivot works with Mash? Yes. So this is um, this is quite an interesting and it's a difficult problem just because of the way that well Maya in itself works. So here we go. If I scale this cube up, and I create a Mash network, and then I'll just space them out slightly and. If I scale these up in the y-axis, you see they're scaling from the center of the of the cube. And what if I wanted them to scale from the bottom of the cube? So there's a few ways that you could go about this. So I'm just going to isolate, select the cube. Hold on. Isolate, select the cube. Now, as you can see, whoa, as you can see, the pivot point is right in the middle of the cube here. Now, what you can't do, what's insert on the laptop? How do you oh. choose the pivot? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. OK. So, which one's that? D. D. So, um, what you can't do is just move the pivot point and then um, have Mash act on that. Uh, sadly, that breaks everything, breaks all of the internal math. So, um, and this is a, a particle instancer thing that we've kind of inherited uh, just because we use the particle instancer. So, what you have to do is when you move a pivot point, 
You then, I'll just make sure this is at the bottom, it roughly is. Uh, what you have to do then is go in and bake the pivot point. So this is a new feature, I think, in 2017 again. And uh, what this does is if I zero out the, um, the translate there, the pivot point is now at the bottom of the mesh with the translate down at zero. So now if I um, t uh, hit control one again to turn off isolate select to see that, oops, they're now all scaling from the bottom. So that's effectively how pivots work. Now the other thing, the other thing to uh, pay attention to here is that um, another way to do this that I often use is grouping uh, the uh, grouping the mesh that's going into mesh here, and we can just call this um, uh, just call out the mesh group, and then you can offset this the position of the mesh anywhere, right, and then. On the instancer, if we were to add the mesh group to that and then remove that, the cube can be offset anywhere basically inside here because uh, the object that's on the instancer is the group that's at the world center. So then you can effectively use that as your pivot. So you can kind of do the pivot backwards by doing that. So a couple of ways to go about it. Um, yeah, so effectively, if you change the pivot point, you have to bake it to get mash to pay any attention to it. Uh, so it's actually it's, it's the same for end particles as well. So, yeah, and imagine how confusing it gets if you haven't got a pivot where you think it is. So it's it's really important that you set up your yes. objects. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think I can help with this one. Um, so the next question is how uh, can you convert animated uh, mesh to a limbic? So I've I've certainly used a limbic with the repro mesh. Uh, so I've, we've managed to actually get it into flame um through the olympic import in flame which has been quite fun so some of these effects we've been able to do with the uh repro mesh we've been able to, to pull through to other packages as well um have you guys got any uh tips on caching stuff out from uh mesh ah live demos <clears throat> um Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's you know it's a simple. You, you obviously again, you need to make sure all your pivots in the right place. There's a utility if you're um, caching stuff out on the instance side of things. Um, as long as you've got a uh, re, as long as you're using repro, just limit it out. Um, but if you're using the instance, you can bake instances to objects using one of the utilities. So there's a utility that I think is actually called bake instances to objects. So um, uh. if you yeah, create the mesh network, and then so if you, if you select the instance to use this, oh, of course, yeah. And then um, you go bake instance to objects, and that will um, create um, an object if you hit bake this frame. Yeah, let's not do the whole animation. And then you basically get real objects for all of your um, uh, for the objects in your mesh network uh, that are off because the original object's hidden. Uh, and um, you can then alembic those out, so and then clear your scenes so that you have a nice lightweight mesh. So uh, that's one way to do that. So we bake them. Um, so we bake them all, all now individual objects. Yeah. So that's how you get an instance. Otherwise, if it's a repro mesh, then you can just um, uh, yeah, as, as you say, just hit, uh, go straight to alembic, and uh, that would, it's just a real mesh, so it just works the same way. So. And uh, yeah, this is probably an interesting one. What do you feel is your most impressive mesh creation? Ian and Chris. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, interesting. I think it's. I think um, we can't. We can't. I. I, I can't talk about what that is. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that I think is one of your most impressive, but sadly that is uh, future facing um, for oh, today. Yeah. But in terms of 2017, uh, 2017 yeah. creations, what would you say is one of your favourites? The, the the repro is really is I mean for us it's been pretty liberating the fact that you know just being able to put mash networks into a mash network for a start I mean the the level of complexity you can get to so quickly like with the uh, the cube demo that you you did earlier um, and there are just a few bits of fun in mash like um, the flight node is just a bit of fun really and um, mm. that's that's always good to play around with what's the the most impressive creation is, is the question. Um, I don't know. Is the question development related or creative related? Yeah, yeah. That's, well, that's quite an answer. Yeah. yeah. Christian, would you like to elaborate on the? <laughs> would you say development or or creative uh, pieces? 
I mean, uh, there's um, uh, uh, there's an example of it's in our is a small bit in our mash reel actually. I wouldn't say it's the most impressive thing, but it was um, it was something we put together for a, a brand called Dar D A R, and we were actually building the tools to create that as you know it, it was sort of in development. Mm -hmm. So Ian was developing stuff, and we had guys in the office saying, you know, I want it to do this, I want it to do that, and. It, <laughs> I mean that that's kind of part of how Mash has grown up, but um, you know that was a really interesting process, and we actually we we effectively solved a client brief both creatively and from a development side all at the same time. So Did you one, one of the most beautiful piece of work we've ever done. It was sort of quite an uh, achievement for us internally. Maps. I'm going to say maps. maps thinking about yeah. it, just because of how powerful they are, and the fact that they're on every single node, like fall off objects. Just being able to control anything with a map is yeah, just creates untold amounts of freedom. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that's that's one of my favourite things, definitely. I'm just yeah. going to bring your reel up again, just so perhaps if there's any that come to mind, there's a couple of people uh, referring back to your Vimeo yeah. page, unless we can play it straight off of the... Uh, yeah, I do have... You got it. Do you want to give the screen back? <laughs> do you want the screen back? Uh, no, no, I mean, we can bring it up straight off of the there if, if you want, or, or I can... I don't know how the... well this will work. This may be a bit chuggy, we'll see. <laughs> There. Someone mentioned earlier earlier on about the screws being done with the Python node. Now Chris did that, and I think it was something to do with the the height of them was controlling the rotation. Was that right? Yeah, the two were linked up. So yeah, it was, and that was a, a map was driving the height. So literally a, a noise map, uh, you know, traveling through, and then yeah, Ian Ian helped me out with the Python, and um, it was very very simple script. We should probably post it up there. <laughs> so I think I think uh, Carla's question is about this, the kind of bubbling up ground here. Now I'm going to say, well, um, Ben, one of the animators at Mainframe, did this, and because of the way it looks, I'm going to say it's Bifrost. Um, <laughs> what do you think? I think it might that's, be. That's, that's still good for the presentation. That's fine. <laughs> I think it's um, an aero that's being meshed, but I'm not. I couldn't say because I didn't do it. But that's I, the other thing. It could be, I suppose, is uh, the uh, texture deformer with a very high resolution mesh, but all, always smoothing that's what it is. with smoothing turned on. So I absolutely love that deformer. It's my favourite deformer in Maya. Just you just like get beautiful things very very quickly. But um, yeah, I think I think it's either the texture deformer with a noise and then smoothing, um, or by frost, but well, we can. It's ask. all Maya. Yeah, it's all Maya. It's yeah, it's all. Yeah. It's all <laughs> you say. I think that's the that's probably something to say. You know, we're not, you know, we're not absolutely wedded to using Mash here. It's obviously freed up a lot of time for us, but yeah, we we kind of use it in conjunction with all the tools we've got going on in Maya as well. Excellent. Well, I think we've got five five minutes left, so if there's time for one more question, perhaps. You missed any? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Oh. Oh, here we go. Everyone's typing madly at once now. <laughs> Who's the fastest typer? I'd like to know. <laughs> Is it Matthew or Christian? <laughs> Both. Just going to say bye. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> The way the way that I would approach something like that, well, of course, there is um, Mash has the ability to talk to paint effects, so you can actually hang things off paint effects using Mash by just dragging paint effects in. But um, something, I mean, growing things like trees and things is actually it's it's quite complex because of of the nature of branching and emitting things. Um, I I would be tempted to do something like use n particles and have n particles split. But you can connect end particles to a mesh network, and then you could add a trails node to kind of draw the mesh as they were being 
Um, and, and so as, as the end particles are moving and splitting, you would then be drawing a trails mesh behind it. And I've seen some, I've seen some pretty cool stuff done um, in that line to get kind of, kind of like, yeah, branching organic look. Um, um, as for as for doing it out of the box with mash, I think it's definitely possible. In the earlier days, what we did was we had um, there's the there's a node in mash called the replicator, and you can uh, duplicate points. If, if I yeah, just hold have, hold the have the mouse for a second. Uh, you can duplicate points uh, like so. So oh. we we're off. You can tell off. you're looking at all the other objects. Yeah. Turned <laughs> off. So. Um, yeah, using the replicator, you can duplicate points. And what I think I did was I um, merged a replicator network. Oh my word, I can't remember. <laughs> I actually can't remember. But but going with n particles and then connecting them to mash. So what you can do is down here you've got utility that say set up n particles with an initial state of mash. Not that one. Connect n particles to mash. That one. So if you select an n particles in a mash network. You can uh, hook them up together and then use mash to draw trails uh, behind the where the n particles are going. And then using some turbulence, like some fields in the in the particles, you can create kind of like interesting looking um, organic structures. Um, but that's yeah, that, I mean, as that was, when I was seeing a style frame, that's how I go about it. <laughs> and you can use um, n particles for things like fall off with color nodes and and things like that to get like a sort of spattering effect. Um, is that right? Yes, yeah, it's absolutely. Um, I was just, I was just reading Andy's question. I'm a City fan, but definitely Hull City, <laughs> not Manchester City. <laughs> Very good. That's good stuff. Um, oh, the one, eyes. One there. Eyes. Okay, one last, one last one, and then we'll uh, we'll have to wrap things up. Um, it's the well, eyes. Actually, really simple. It is. Yes. Yeah, so um, I think it says it down here as well. So I'm gonna. Yeah. So there's more info. So there is a little tutorial here. Well, I say tutorial, it's more of a a stream of consciousness here. But <laughs> um, so yeah, the input mesh on the mesh network was a small. If you imagine a sphere and just taking a sliver of that sphere, and then using an offset mode, uh, offset mode on the rotation, we then created uh, and I've called it this cliche, which for me is this thing. Where is it? Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Everyone's favorite. There you go. Everyone's favorite motion graphic motif. That thing. So if you can imagine using instead of let's using a trig node to do the jump um, to the rotation, but so effectively this is made of lots of almost like think about them like arm, an armadillo, kind of opening up, and then we've distributed some uh, some spheres onto the first one, and then use the uh, I think we've reproed the repro or we might have replicated it. I can't remember. And then effectively, you're just you're just keeping adding another repro to another repro. So you then you've got this. You put the eyeball in, and then you take that whole that whole kind of a group in to another mesh network. You distribute it onto a grid, i.e. this grid here. You add um, maybe some random rotation, random scale, random scale, and then using the time node to offset the time of each animation, and you get that kind of really crazy. Yeah, it's yeah. very effective. It looks really, really complex, but it's made up of very, very simple. It's it's in like inputs. It's like the cube tutorial. It it on the yeah on the surface it looks like something really complicated, but really the setup is yeah minutes. Yeah, well, I mean that's why I, I deliberately didn't speed up that video either, just because it is that quick and easy to do. You know, you didn't want to show any uh, any smoke and mirrors. Just wanted to share it in real time, really, to show that really just that. The benefits of mash are just how quick it is to generate these kind of effects. Yeah, exactly, and it's really it's sort of it's an open-ended book. Oh, oh you're playing. Ah. <laughs> Stop talking. <laughs> um, so just before we kind of wrap things up, I just wanted to point out to anyone who hasn't already seen it, there are a lot of web links uh, in the bottom left of the screen, um, which. Um, Oh, we've we've got an infinity loop going on. <laughs> um, yeah, we've got a lot of web links in the bottom side of the screen. I can actually make this window a little bit bigger so we can see them all. And uh, these will cover a lot of the um, topics that we've talked about today. So we mentioned create creative market. Obviously, you guys have got that fantastic Vimeo channel. 
Um, and then there's also the drive with the motion graphics uh, website that we've um, made live now on the um, Autodesk website. Um, so I, I think that's all we've got time for today in terms of questions. Um, was there anything you guys would like to add as a, a closer? Show us what you do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, one, of, one of the highlights for us of doing this is, um, you know, as a motion graphics studio ourselves, it's seeing the work other people are producing. So, uh, yeah, send it our way. We love seeing it. It makes us feel warm and fuzzy. <laughs> Definitely. And then um, just for anyone who wants to stay on for an additional five minutes, I was just going to cover a little bit about some of your support options for Maya. So not motion graphics related, just support in general and, and how you get help if you need it but uh in terms of uh the motion graphics side of things and um having our special guests chris and ian with us today uh very special thanks to you guys for um taking the time to give us a real good insight into uh the sort of things we can do and and putting you on the spot there in particular with that python example i, I think you uh, coped very well so. yeah, think of one on the way back <laughs> Great. Yes. All right. Well, um, I'll, I'll say goodbye to uh, the mainframe team. And uh, I'm just going to do a quick five minutes of uh, where you can find support if you need it uh, for Maya. Thanks, Robert. Thank Thanks, guys. For anyone who's still on, I'm just going to load up a couple of quick slides just to say how you can get some help if you require it. So we've got a few options available. So uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the um, uh, knowledge network at Autodesk. So there's a few different um, options available to you within the knowledge network. We have uh, the community side of it. So the, the forums are excellent because obviously a lot of problems and um, solutions have already been uh, derived within the forums. So, so this is a good starting point for you to be able to get some answers. Uh, the other um, way to get support is actually through your account login. So where you would go to deal with your licenses and number of seats, you can actually uh, launch a support, a specific support case if you really feel like you need help and uh, you can't find the answers through the knowledge network, you can actually get to it through your accounts login as well. So this is definitely worth worth knowing about as, as a, a way to get assistance if required. So as we mentioned before, there's the uh, community side of this. So it's, it is a lot of um, dev guys and support guys from Autodesk are on these forums as well. So uh, the nice thing is that, you, you know, you, you will get answers from us internally, but you'll also be getting answers from the community um, in terms of artists and uh, and that's what makes it a useful tool is that we've got this huge knowledge base between if you think of all the people using Maya around the world. And then, you know, if a ticket is not getting solved uh, within the forum, it'll get escalated uh, uh, to help you get on your way. And then we've also for advanced support customers, we have the ability to actually get support on the phone. So if, if your if your package that you're paying for includes advanced support, you'll be able to contact us and you can also schedule a call as well, where if if you know what time of day you're going to be free and you want to set aside some time, we can actually call you. And this can all be done through your accounts uh, by setting up advanced support. So uh, this would be available also on the uh, knowledge.autodesk.com. And uh, this is where you can go to schedule a call, but, but it is down to what level of support you're actually paying for. Okay, so that was just a quick sort of five minutes showing you the options. So we talked about the community, we talked about being, up, being able to get to support through your account login. And just the general uh, knowledge network is where we have a lot of this stuff available. And all of these links are down there with the web links um, on the bottom left of the screen here. So do feel free to copy and paste some of these links. Um, I'll leave these up for a little bit so people can, can view 
this stuff and uh, thank you very much for taking the time to log in today. I know everyone's very busy um, and uh, do let us know what you thought about the presentation and I hope it was uh, of use to everyone.